All right. In this work example, we're going to take a look at using the law of conservation of momentum to solve for the final velocity. It looks like of that block all the way to the right there. But first, let's state what is meant by the mass of a body. Does anybody know? So what mass is, is the amount of matter. Mass is the amount of matter. And we know it's measured in kilograms. It really tells us how many like atoms are inside of the thing, okay? It is an intrinsic property of a substance, like how much, how much matter it possesses. It doesn't change based on where the object is located in the universe. It's perhaps you know, a good idea right now to remind ourselves that weight okay, is the force of gravity. And so it's equal to mass times the acceleration due to gravity. So mass is the intrinsic property of the substance, how much matter it possesses. The influence of gravity on that mass gives the force of gravity or the weight. So the weight of an object will change based on if it's on Earth or on the moon or on Jupiter in different gravity fields. But the mass is intrinsic to that substance. We can also think about mass in terms of Newton's second law uh, and say, well, mass is really the tendency to resist any change in motion, right? So we could say that it's the ratio of like force to acceleration. The more massive something is for a given force, the less it's going to accelerate, right? Applying the same force to a very massive thing and a low mass thing, the low mass thing accelerates a lot. The very inert thing accelerates a little bit, right? So inertia, inertial mass, the tendency to resist change in motion is another way to sort of describe mass. Now I'm gonna go sort of beyond the scope of the AS level physics here and give you yet another way to think about mass in terms of gravitational mass. So Newton's law of universal gravitation is this. And another way to think about mass is like making M here the subject of this equation. So the M would be what? F R squared over G M. So if you have a mass sitting above sort of Earth's gravity field at some position, it's got sort of two competing sort of effects here. A very massive thing has lots of tendency to resist change in motion, right? So it takes a lot of force to get that thing moving. And yet the very massive thing is also attracted to, to the earth due to its gravitational mass. And Einstein realized that inertial mass and gravitational mass are the same thing. And that's called his principle of equivalence which is a very important idea in the general theory of relativity, our best theory of gravity still today. Okay. Um, this goes beyond the scope of AS level physics, but it's in A level. And, and we use it all the time in astronomy, obviously, because it's the law of universal gravitation. For our purposes here, mass is just the amount of matter or inertial mass is good to say, it's the tendency to resist change in motion. All right. Moving right along, it gives us some information here. And um, before we calculate the speed V, it actually poses a question. It says, use Newton's third law to explain why during the collision, the change in momentum of block A is equal and opposite to the change in momentum of block B. It's a very similar question to the one that we had um, last Friday and on Monday, for those of you that, that sort of took Friday off, um, where, nearly the same, but it's not identical. That question read, use Newton's third law to explain the relationship between the rate of change of momentum of the ball and the rate of change of momentum. Note that this one doesn't have the same language. It doesn't say to describe the rate of change, but just the change in momentum. So yesterday we did some lab work where we looked at force is the rate of change of momentum. The question on Friday said, use Newton's third law to explain the relationship between the rate of change Right? In other words, between the forces. Here, it's saying, use Newton's third law to explain why the change in momentum. So it's saying just the numerator now. It's not saying the rate of change. It's saying use Newton's third law, which tells us something about forces, to explain why during the collision, the change in momentum of block A is equal and opposite to the change in momentum of block B. Well, because Newton's third law tells us that forces exist in pairs, equal in magnitude, opposite in direction. We know that the left side of the equation is the same, like the force of this block on that one is equal and opposite to the force of this block on the other one. But we need to say something on these lines about how 
the time must also be the same, right? In order to explain why this has to be the same, well, like if the force is the same, the only way to make this the same is if the time of contact is the same. And it should make sense to you that like when things collide, they are in contact with each other for the same amount of time. Like one object isn't in contact with the other one for longer or shorter, right? That just doesn't even pass the common sense test. So yes, things that collide are in contact for the same amount of time. And it's important to state that, you know, sort of in your own words to get to sort of this answer here. So that, that's two marks there. The question goes on to ask us to determine V. Okay, and so that's this velocity up here. It's probably easier to just kind of work with this figure here. So clear that off. Zoom in a bit. All right. So how do we calculate the speed V here? Obviously, we're going to use conservation of momentum. So before there's some initial momentum, which is calculable, and afterwards there's some final momentum, and we know they have to be equal because momentum is conserved. The initial momentum, there's some momentum from this object, and so mass times velocity. And look at the velocities, all in meters per second. So we know that this velocity will be in meters per second. You don't have to do any conversions or anything like that. So I have the mass of this object, 3m, times the velocity, 0.4. So I'm going to drop the units from my calculation just to kind of tidy it up a bit. Plus this mass times its velocity. And what's its velocity? Negative 0.25. Because this is left opposing this positive to the right, we adopt the sign convention say, okay, this momentum, we're actually going to subtract away from this one to get the initial momentum. Be mindful of the sign convention. We, at the end of yesterday's lab work, we emphasized where that negative sign, what the source of it was, right? The force was negative because it opposed the initial velocity um, of the marble sort of entering the stop zone, right? In our loop track lab. The final momentum here, we got this object 3M going at a speed of 0.2. And then we have this object M going at some unknown speed V. So there's your equation. This plus this equals this plus that. Do some algebra now and let me know what you get for V. For the benefit of uh, everybody following along on YouTube, that's like, why well, I, I have an algebra question here. And maybe there's even some students in class that have an algebra question. I'm going to go ahead and go through the working up here. So I just copied this sort of up here. There's that negative sign. Don't forget about it. 3m times 0.4 is 1.2m. Point, negative 0.25 times m is negative 0.25m. Uh, 3m times 0.2 is 0.6m. This is just m. 1.2 m minus 0.25 m, 0.95 m. And here's where the sign convention can really, you know, lead you down the wrong path. If you're not mindful that this velocity is negative or you're not mindful that the momentum of this object is negative relative to this momentum, then here you're gonna add these and get like 1.45 and then the incorrect solution. So the correct way to, to add these momenta is to recognize that this is negative relative to that equals 0.6 m plus mv, subtract 0.6 m from both sides. Here, sometimes students will make an algebra mistake. They'll try to like combine these unlike terms or something like that, or they won't combine their like terms correctly. So you don't want to make algebra mistakes. So 0.95 minus 0.6, uh, 0.95 m minus 0.6 m is 0.35 m. Just kind of continuing my working over here because it's getting a bit cluttered. Subtracted that from both sides, so that's just equal to mv. And the final step is to just divide by m. And so they didn't have to tell us the mass, just like relative to each other. This thing is three times more massive, so it has three times the, you know, inertia. And so v is 0.35. And if you got that, well done. Who among you can calculate the relative speed of approach? talking to you, YouTube, leave it down in the comments below. You can calculate the relative speed of approach. Check out some of these other videos in the momentum playlist to see how we deal with perfectly elastic and inelastic collisions. 
All right, it's on the tip of everybody's tongue. Let's call it out together. Don't worry, I'll edit that in. I'll edit it in so that it's a resounding, you know, uh, in unison, we all say it together. So does anybody know? Looking at their notes there, they're like, oh, to calculate relative speed, got a note like that in your journal somewhere? How do we calculate relative speed? What's the relative speed of approach? In a moment, I'm gonna ask you to calculate the relative speed of separation also. And then I'll ask you to sort of use those values to, to state whether or not this collision is elastic or inelastic. So that's where we're going with this. Um, sometimes they'll tell us the collision. They'll say, here's a perfectly elastic collision. And then we know something about the relative speeds already. Here, we just know the speeds. Now we have to sort of calculate based on those speeds, whether or not this thing is perfectly elastic. We know it's not inelastic because look, they bounced off, right? Like this thing is moving away from this one faster than this thing is. So it's, it's somewhat elastic, but is it perfectly elastic? If it is, then the relative speed of approach will be what? Equal to the relative speed of separation. We gotta be able to show that mathematically. Who knows what the relative speed of approach is over here? Call it out if you got it. What's the number? Opposite add, right? You just add their speed. If, if things travel the opposite direction, it's like two cars passing each other in opposite directions on the highway, but they're both going 75, one going 75 north, one going 75 south, they zoom past each other at 150 miles per hour. They see each other at that relative speed. So these things will see each other at what speed? 0.65. The relative speed of approach is 0.65. You add the speeds to calculate the relative speed when things are traveling in opposite directions. Opposite add. Same subtract, right? Here they're traveling in the same direction. We know the speed of this one now. We're given the speed of this one. What's the relative speed of separation? It's just the speed, so we don't really care about the negative sign or, or you know, so like we know the, the direction based on the way the arrow is pointing. So it's just taking these numbers and saying, oh, same subtract, 0.35 minus 0.2 is 0.15, is 0.65 equal to 0.15? Is the relative speed of approach equal to the relative speed of separation? No, and therefore the collision is, is not perfectly elastic, is somewhat inelastic. Usually collisions are somewhat inelastic. If they bounce off, there's gonna be some energy losses. Some of the kinetic energy is converted to like sound energy and to heat energy and to deforming the material. Like these, these blocks might be crumpled up a bit as they crashed into each other. And so the, the remaining parts of this question ask us to sort of work through those calculations. We determine the speed V, 0.35. Calculate the relative speed of approach. That was 0.65 because they were opposite direction. Calculate the relative speed of separation. That was 0.15 because they were going the same direction. And then we use our answers to state that the collision is somewhat inelastic. Or you could say it's inelastic. It's not perfectly elastic. If it were perfectly elastic, the relative speed of approach would have to equal the relative speed of separation. So sometimes we have to use the information given to reach a conclusion like what kind of collision it is. Other times they tell us what kind of collision it is and we use those ideas to then work through and sort of calculate something else like the velocity or something. All right, well done everybody. This has been another work example with Dr. Schleich. We'll see you next time.